Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, poetry night with Irina Shavalova. My name is Lesa Khromychuk. Most of you know me already. I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London, and we are a center for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. Um, and I'd like to highlight that we are a registered charity and mostly funded through our events and donations. And so we're extremely grateful to those of you who purchased your tickets for tonight's um, event. It allows us to run other events free of charge. Um, as always, um, this uh, event will last 90 minutes and we will be treated to the readings of some poetry uh, by the poet, by Irina uh, Shavalova today. And we'll also have a chance to discuss Irina's work uh, in um, a QA and a session um, after the readings. Um, so prepare your questions and uh, participate in the discussion as much as you can. We will not be recording the discussion part of the event, so it would be lovely if you could keep your cameras on um, so we could see each other. Uh, it's always nice when we can see your faces and know, you know, try and recreate a kind of atmosphere of an in-person poetry night if we can. Uh, great, so it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight. Uh, it's Nina Mari. She was born and raised in Lviv in Western Ukraine. Uh, she holds advanced degrees in linguistics and creative writing. She's the author, uh, the author of the poetry coll collection Alcestis in the Underworld, which was published in uh, 2019, as well as chapbooks Minimize Considered, to, uh, published in 2018, Minor Heresies, which was published in 2020, and Damascus Electric, published in 2020 as well. Her translations from Russian and Ukrainian include um, Peter Alishkovsky's Starhered, Oksana Zabushko's Museum of Abandoned Secrets, and those of you who have read it know how large that book is and what a what a spectacular work for a translator to um, accomplish and Oksana Lucishina's Ivan and Phoebe which is forthcoming this year with um, Deep Vellum uh, and Nina has also been an absolutely invaluable volunteer at the Ukrainian Institute London over the last few months she's been helping us organize um, events in particular the celebration of Ukraine's 30th anniversary of independence um, and I am really thrilled to say that um, the online version of our summer party to celebrate Ukraine's independence on the 24th of August will include a conversation between Nina and Oksana Lutishina and some of the reading, the uh, reading of the translation of Ivan and Phoebe, which you will hear for the first time if you join the party um, before it's even published. So there's a there's definitely an incentive to, to join us on the 24th of August. We'll send the links in chat later on to, to all of these things. Right, um, Nina, thank you for moderating this event and uh, I pass the mic to you. Well, thank you so much, Alessa. And uh, it's an honor to be here and it's it, absolutely a pleasure and a treat to be moderating conversation with Irina Shovalova. Um, who has a very long bio and very spectacular one. Um, but suffice to say that today we're here to experience her poetry, which is, and then from the poetry, we will branch out into other areas of her um, activity because there is also a translator and a scholar and a researcher. So, um, you have two poets here in front of you, so we, we'll try not to get too carried away. Um, uh, please, this is a small group, so if you want to wave your hand or ask a question in the chat, I'll work it in. But the way we thought we'd start is we'll let Irina read some of her poems for you. And they uh, are in two languages, so some of them you will hear in both Ukrainian and English, and others you will hear only in English. That's just for the... Um, we are averaging out our likely audience there. So Irina, over to you. Well, thank you, Nina, and hello, everyone. Um, it's absolutely lovely to be with you tonight. Um, thank you for joining, and I hope we will all enjoy this conversation. So yeah, like Nina said, I will read a couple of poems just to get us started. And I'm already changing things on the go. So um, I, I apologize in advance to my uh, lovely moderator and, and to everyone else. But um, I thought that in this first block of poems, which will be a short one, you know, we will do a couple of those blocks and, and they will be maybe five to seven minutes long. But in the first block, I would really like to do those several poems in that block in both languages. 
just so that we can begin with getting a bit of a taste of how things sound in Ukrainian. And then for the next ones, we'll figure out, I suppose. Um, so what I wanted to do for the first block were very different poems. Um, so there we go. The first one comes um, from a cycle of poems called Conversations About War, But Not Only. Um, and it's the first poem of that cycle. I will read it in Ukrainian first, and then I will do the English version of the same poem. Rozmowy pro vinu i ne tilke. U vas tam kontaktna zona, govorit ulrich, pobliskujuči s kelcami okuljarjev, inteligentno vsmihajučis. Za veknom misto bezporadno zatočujuć se vid snihu, ce zvir z izhodu, kažuć senoptike, i my jim vierimo, jakže ne vierite v zvira, tem pače z izhodu. Ja govorju, ni, ni, u nas vina, septo ja vživaju jakis inši, metodologično korektnišaj termin, ale na spravdi ja maju na ovazi same jeji, vinu, jaka bohata na imena, i najstrašniši z nich ti, ščo najvičljivši. Naprejklad, konflikt, konflikt na shodji, ne sklalo se, ne podelili šus, ne dišli konsensusu, ne zišli sa charakterami, jak stare podružje, po svim, konflikt. Z enšeho boku, uljih pravi, adže vina, ce kontaktni vid sportu, Ти підступаєш до іншого надто близько, так близько, що відчуваєш запах його поту, чуєш його дихання. І навіть потім, коли воно переривається, і ти опускаєш зброю, ця близькість не полишає тебе. Мусиш змивати її з себе під душем, довго, довго, старанно, терти. А може, йдеться про контакти jaki z pozazemnymi cywilizacjami, a że po tej bieg linii frontu inna galaktyka, jak ci czurzyńcy, jak ci tubilcy, jak ci prybulcy smieją wbywać i pomierać, niczym nie zgirsza za nas, jak smieją być na stylki ludźmi i nie ludźmi w odnoczas. Też, majże jak my, jak smieją być takimi jak my. Jak? Smijuć. Ja ne pewna, czy to te, co mam na uwazie Ulrich. And the translation of this very same poem. What you have there is a contact zone, says Ulrich. The lenses of his eyeglasses flashing, his smile intelligent. Behind the window, the city is helplessly inundated with snow. It's the beast from the east, says the meteorologists, and we believe them. For how can you not believe in a beast, especially one from the east? I say, no, no, uh, what we have is a war. That is, I use some other methodologically more correct term. But what I really mean is war. The one with many names, the most frightening of them being the polite ones. For example, a conflict, a conflict in the East where something was left unresolved, something did not get sorted, consensus was not reached, the two parties found themselves incompatible, like an old married couple. There you go, a conflict. On the other hand, Ulrich is right. War is a contact sport. You step too close to the other, so close that you can smell their sweat, can hear them breathing. And even afterwards, when it stops and you drop your weapon, this closeness remains with you. You have to wash it off in the shower for a long, long time, scrubbing vigorously. Or perhaps what we have is a contact like that with extraterrestrial civilizations. Because the other side of the front line is like another galaxy. 
how dare those outsiders, those um, primitives, those aliens kill and die just as well as we do? How dare they be so human and inhumane all at once, almost like us too? How dare they be like us? How dare they? I'm not sure if this is what Ulrich was trying to say. Um, and in addition to that, I'm going to read a very different poem, um, which is called Ryba Lubov in Ukrainian, and that means love fish in English. Ryba Lubov живе у великому тілі ріки. Ходить у ньому як маятник, вперед і назад, і по колу, припнута до всі серця. Вона терпляче мандрує від коріння води до її розлогої крони. Ходить дорогами, що на них жодного сліду, тільки твій. Риба любов співає жаб'ячими вустами, мурашиним голосом. Ах, яка потворна, яка сліпа, не варта найменшої згадки в найтоншій книжці. Яка голодна, харчується тінями дотиків, слідами цілунків на теплому горлі дня. Знає, що з усіх імен твоє ім'я наймиліше, а тому, запливаючи в глибокі колодязі, ронить великі камінні сльози, круглі. Вони важко лягають на дно крізь прозору товщу води. Риба любов знає, що ім'я твоє дзвонить, як браслети на зап'ястях танцюристки-циганки. Від нього йде луна, так наче у великій порожній церкві хтось розсипав торбу мідних монет. Або солдати на площі одночасно кинули зброю тисячу шабель. Ім'я твоє гостре, взяти ніжно під язик воно коле у роті і зубчастим шпичаком виходить крізь губу. Пливи, риболюбов, доки росте твоє велике дерево води, доки живе своїм тихим життям залізний гачок у твоїй губі. Тримає тебе на прив'язі, тримає тебе на прив'язі, тримає тебе на прив'язі і, ніжно поторсавши, щоразу приводить додому. And uh, a translation of this poem. Love fish. The love fish lives in the large body of the river. It swims in it like a pendulum back and forth and in a circle, fastened to the heart's axis. It patiently meanders from the water's roots to its spreading branches, swims paths that are covered with only your traces. The love fish sings with a frog's mouth, with an ant's voice. Oh, how ugly it is, how blind, not worth the slightest mention in the thinnest book, so hungry that it is shadows. Touches, traces of kisses on the warm throat of the day, it knows that out of all names, your name is the dearest. And so, swimming into the deep wells, it sheds large, round, stone, tears, falling heavily to the bottom through the thick, clear water. The love fish knows that your name rings like bracelets on the wrists of a gypsy dancer, that it echoes like a bag of copper coins scattered in a large, empty church, or like the sound of soldiers in the square, throwing down their weapons all at once, a thousand swords. Your name is sharp. When taken tenderly beneath the tongue, it pierces the mouth and the tip comes out through the lip. Swim, love fish, while your big tree of water grows, while the iron hook in your lip lives its quiet life, 
keeping you tethered, keeping you tethered, keeping you tethered and tenderly pulling ever closer to home. That's lovely. That is such a lovely, that's such a lovely ending to that poem was that last word home and the Doma. It, it's, it's really, um, gets me every time. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. So I think the first question I have is going to be fairly obvious. And um, it's great that the book is available in both languages. So it's the Ukrainian and English is printed on faces facing pages so you can right. safely give it to a friend who is uh, does not read Ukrainian but of course it's more fun to read both and I understand that Irina you self-translated with Olena Jennings um, right that's correct talk, yep talk to me about the process of self-translation and how that worked for you because you're also a translator from English to Ukrainian if I'm correct including um the, the, the galactic bestseller, Milk and Honey, Rupi Kaur's book. Um, talk to me about yeah. the process and the experience of translating yourself. See, you, you reveal all of my dirty secrets. Um, yeah, um, well, um, so first of all, how was it? It was, it was tough. It was, it was horrible translated myself. I, I, um, it was lovely to work with Elena Jennings, who, who is a fantastic translator. And uh, I'm sure we have many more wonderful books from Ukraine um, that will come out from her sort of translator span. Um, so I, I really enjoyed working with Elena, but it was, it was absolutely horrendous <laughs> trying to step away from your own work and, and pretend that, that you are someone sort of separate from it, or at least separate to some extent. And um, I, I didn't expect it to be quite, quite as horrendous because, uh, you know, I've translated poetry before. Uh, I, I sort of translate mostly between uh, Ukrainian, English, and Russian in, in different variations. And, and so I thought I was prepared. I was not prepared. Um, so uh, I, I suffered through it. And Elena was very patient with me, but um, honestly, I mean, for future reference, I'm I'm, I'm very happy to be to be available for for any of my translators. But I, I probably would never <laughs> want to find myself in the same role again. Um, I, I I honestly much prefer translating other people's work uh, because of the distance that you can have, and also because maybe of that you know kind of secret joy of trying out someone else's voice and. That might be something familiar for you, Nina, because you're such an accomplished translator yourself. Um, but yes, I, I think it's it's that part that I love most, and it's the hardest part mm -hmm. to be translating yourself. So yeah, I guess that's my it's answer. The only consolation, I self-translated a few poems of my own, and I hated every minute of it, and I thought I did it. <laughs> oh, good, good, thoughts. good. Let's agree to hate that. Yep. So so let's agree on, you know, we, we can just get in touch with each other next time it comes up and, you know, work it out. Do some workshops, you know, and exchange our poems. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, that's fantastic. So I wanted to ask you about um, the, the sort of zooming out a little bit and talking about different parts of the book. And you've read us a poem from the first I believe from the first third of the book, right. uh, Rebel and 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 um, a poem from the later part of the book. What struck me as a reader as I was going through it is that there are such different universes in in, in the different parts of the book. Um, and I've been working on my chronotope theory of this, but I want I, I'm not ready. I'll just say this: it the, for the for me the first half where where um, and and. Uh, Love Fish is a very good example, is a very, to me, a very elemental universe. It's, it's kind of the five elements of life are there. It's the stone, water, wind, wood, little animals and whatnot. And, and they just populate and interlink with each other in such different combinations. It's a very populated, it's a crowded place, but it's, mm -hmm. it's also a very kind of multi-layered place and a and it plays with its own time and space. Whereas in the letter, in the later parts of the book, I felt that place changes, it's different, it's much more immediate. There are a couple of poems that are actually set 
in specific locations and physically specific locations, but also as one about Ulrich. Conversations with Ulrich, it's a conversation with a particular person. I felt like I could hear both speakers talking about it. So the time span or rather the moment, the moment in the poem is a lot shorter. Um, and I should ask a question about this and let me formulate it like this. Does this make sense to you as a writer? Did you intend it that way? And what was the intention um, and the feeling of creating mm -hmm. those different universes? Well, that's, that's such a great question. And I hate to complicate things, but, but I, I need to complicate things first be, before I give a sort of a coherent answer. So in reality, things are even more complicated. So not only this book has sort of three parts, right? It itself is part of a different book, which also has three parts. So this book in three parts is one of the three parts of a different book, uh, which I know is very confusing. I even, yeah, I have this book somewhere here. So this was a book that came out in Ukraine. It's called Coming Sad Lease in one word but it's three words put together. So it roughly means stone, orchard, woods, sort of. And this book here is actually in the very middle. So it's the middle part of this book. Um, and I like doing the things um, or rather, it's not that I'm playing with things. It's that the things arrange themselves in particular ways. And what I'm trying to do is to see how they arrange themselves. Because I think when I'm inside my writing process and I'm inside my poems, sometimes it's very hard to see the bigger picture and sort of the, the overall patterns that emerges from, from the writing process. But when I have something like a manuscript, right? And I can put it aside and, and let it, you know, just be there for a bit. And I actually do print out those things. I, I, I reuse all the paper afterwards, I swear, but I do print them out because I, I, I sort of need to touch them physically and I let it lie for a bit. And then I come back to it and I start seeing those, those patterns. To me, it's an absolutely fantastic thing. And um, I, I agree with you that, you know, there is a lot of natural world and you know, I, I've, I've been translating Ted Hughes for many years. So it's, it's always something that sort of the universe that is very, very close for me. Um, kind of this mystical natural universe. Um, and then yes, the, yes, the second part has a bit more of, of political poems, but also of course, heartbreak poems. Uh, no, no, no poetry book is quite complete without heartbreak poems. So there are some in there and actually maybe I will read them um, next. And yes, the third part, um, I don't even know how to describe the third part because I think we are kind of headed, headed somewhere towards the outer space in it. I don't know where things kind of fall apart, like those natural things, they, they, they sort of, you know, first they're left at the outskirts of, of our daily lives, but then, then we kind of just go somewhere where things just fall apart, but then reassemble themselves in, in odd ways. And um, probably now I will also have afterwards to read something from the third part so that it would make sense. Um, but, you know, I mean, essentially, uh, there's a very limited number of things any poet can write about. So, you know, it's, it's more or less death, love and, and the divine. And, and so I guess, you know, strangely so, my, my natural world is kind of the world of death, world of death I think, but, but it's this kind of death as, as a very, you know, positive process, the death life kind of thing. And, and then probably there's love in the second part. And I guess in the third part, yeah, the divine is there somewhere and I'm floating towards it like poor major Tom, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I hope that answer you, answers your question. That's fantastic. I think it's very true that all poems are equally real to the poet who wrote them at the same time. It's kind of like that saying about all stories are true, right? So all poems exist in the same way. And it only makes sense that you would find different ways to combine them as you write new ones and maybe pull up the old ones. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I've seen um, Tamin said Lisa as well in Ukraine, just, just only in Ukrainian. Um, 
and, and I think I may have recognized some of the some of the imagery and some of the lines. Yeah. Um, and I will ask one more question, and then I will um, give our audience a chance maybe to ask any questions at this point, or if not, and if you don't have questions, then we'll just go on to reading, because I want to pick up on what Irina said about the first part kind of being um, the world of life, but also world of death, right? And I very much like the line that comes out. I think it's in Genius Losai. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to quote it in Ukrainian. There are lines that say, the Yale zalishili zaglibene v povitri. Tak hliboki sadna berutsa kirkoyu. The Yale zalishili zaglibene v povitri. There where we had stood, we left dance in the air. And so I want to ask about the status what is the existential status of the people of these figures in the second and third how, uh, parts of the book? How do you feel about them? What is their place? Hmm. Their place is problematic. Um, to, to, to sort of give the shortest answer possible, it's problematic because I find transience problematic uh, despite all my kind of professed, I mean, I just professed it myself, right? It's a sort of pantheistic, you know, life, death, continuum thing, which uh, supposedly should make me an optimist about these things and kind of put my mind at ease, but no, it doesn't. Um, I'm, I'm working on it, but I find transience problematic. I find memory problematic. I find aging problematic, not as a whole. It's, it's just sort of a set of my very personal little problems that become my very personal quests. But I'm very conscious of the fact that as a poet, it's a very tricky way sort of you have of writing about your own pro problems or, or quests or challenges because they sort of become not just your own. And, and that's a huge responsibility. And, and of course, you know, when we speak about things like memory, um, there is no such thing as memories that belongs just to me. Right. And so, for example, in this book, but also in the Ukrainian books that we just mentioned, Coming in Sad Leaves, um, there is a lot of trying to to actually feel the shapes of those dents in the air, as you put it. Um, maybe just to give a very, very sort of um, brief overview of, of my family background. So so I, I do come from a working class background and um, um, sort of on, on both sides of my family, so my father's and my mother's family, um, we, we mostly had peasants and a, a lot of uh, those people, again, as much as we know about them, I'm sort of digging through their archives still, but um, they, they often were illiterate um, because of the conditions they lived in. They didn't have opportunities to, to be able to kind of leave that mark. Um, by means of writing or by means of, I don't know, achieving some things that we sometimes deem worthy of becoming part of, you know, what we call history, right? So their only way of, of leaving the mark was, you know, by leaving those dents in the air with their voices, with their bodies, right? Um, and so for me, um, was this very, very strange capacity of, of actually writing something um, that, becomes physical, it becomes books. It's, it's a marvel to me, honestly. Um, and people read those books and um, it becomes more than just about me or more just about my family. So it's a way of investigating that. And maybe also of investigating that dent in the air that I perhaps um, leave after myself. I, 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 I'm still trying to figure out that shape. Maybe, um, maybe my next book actually, because it already exists in the manuscript. Um, it might be about that. So I finally, I started, you know, playing, playing it safe. I started with my family and then I got closer and closer. And finally I realized, wow, I have to answer some questions about myself to myself. And uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing with that, but I'm trying. That's all we can do, right? And that's all a poet ever does. You just you just keep trying and see what we'll see what comes out. So I'll ask and thank you. That's that's just fascinating to listen uh, to your answers. I'll ask our audience to see if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question, or if there is a question in the chat. 
And if not, please save your questions until later. Um, and then in that case, I don't see anybody uh, jumping up and down. So I think it's time for our second batch of readings of your choice, Irena. Sure. Um, I, I promised before that um, I will read some of quote unquote love poems, right? So um, I'll do that. Um, I'll you give said it a heartbreak. Is there going to be oh, well, I mean, what's love without heartbreak? And obviously, no heartbreak without love. So, yeah, yeah, um, it's that one. Mm. So, there's a cycle in, in, in the second part of the book. So, you know, this uh, the world of the living um, part of the book where Ulrich also is. Um, and this cycle is called Genius Lossy. Um, so the genius of the place, sort of. Um, and yeah, it's a heartbreak cycle. So let me see, let me start with number four. And this one I will just read in English. No one ever really lets anyone go, ever forgets ever allows them to leave, ever calls a taxi to the train station, ever walks them to the door, ever helps with their coat. When the car drives off, no one lingers behind with the door open because what if you forgot something? What if you'll be back? What if you'll be back in a moment? What if not? And no one ever clears the table of the cup of coffee that is still warm. No one looks around the room, hoping that the objects in it somehow lost the traces of your presence. No one turns their confused gaze to where you are no more. No, mm -mm. no one ever afterwards lies in the bed that still smells of you ever tucks themselves into the covers like into some living warmth no one feels despair and of course most certainly no one ever cries you left but the memory of you lives on in my home, stealthily as a mouse. It runs underneath the bed at night, clicks its small paws, rustles papers, leaves its droppings in the corners. There's no way to get rid of it. It avoids the traps that took me so long to set, jamming my fingers, gasping, crying like a baby. Wise, wise mouse, small old beast, smart enough to sit in the corner for days, not moving, not squeaking, pretending it doesn't exist. It sits, tucking its paws, tail, and shadow beneath it. At night, it becomes braver, comes into the center of the room with a twitching nose, it breezes in the air. The house smells of yesterday's bread, wool socks, shower gel, my fears and my dreams. The mouse comes, sits on my pillow, pensively grooming its whiskers. I open my mouth and sleep, move my lips as if about to say something, but instead I just breathe. So this is all from the same cycle. We'll just read a couple of things. Lost objects live in another country. Beneath beds and tables, behind couches, and in the depths of distant drawers, time flows differently, not like it does here. Here where I'm trying to pick up my future in the corners of my room. 
to sweep my past over the threshold, to drag myself from under my present as from under the pieces of a torn down building. Meanwhile, my tissue, forgotten in the gap between the nightstand and the bed, still peacefully lives in the same space with those two of us who intertwine our legs when falling asleep and in our sleep breathe quietly like children. When after sex she foolishly cries, he wipes her tears away. And the last poem in this block is this one. In the bathroom, I wash off our future children. They don't resist. Instead, dripping quietly down the drain, running through the pipes, soaking the earth. Finally, they are carried out somewhere far by a small river, lazy, calm, splashing about among the reeds and duckweed among the round-eyed fish and meddling insects, among the sun-warmed shoals and small whirlpools, our future children are laughing. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, that's lovely. Again, so many transitions now that we're speaking with you and we, we um, sort of have your presence here there are so many ways in which one kind of existence becomes a different kind of existence the things don't go away the, the things things move to another plane another time they become a mouse um they become they become something else they go and play with the fish it's um it's it's just marvelous it's a universe that is that is alive and uh, very very full um so I have another question for you. And uh, after that, I really encourage our audience to take advantage of our time together and ask some questions. I know you have them. Be brave. Um, this is why we have this in a, in a meeting format and we're not in, in a webinar format and we will not record you, so please do. Uh, I was wondering, again, in the first poem that you read, um, the, I love that line, and most certainly no one cries. It's, it's, it's very, very didactic there. That's know? obvious. <laughs> yes, absolutely not. Um, I, in, again, in the first part of the book, I frequently felt, uh, or I found that, that you were addressing, the voice in the poems was addressing a woman. Um, and we can talk more about who she is or why she's there or how that works out, right? And I feel like it's a different, it's a bit of a different, it's a different voice, obviously, and it's a different woman who gets addressed in the in this particular section of the book. The, the, in other words, the woman who is instructed, who is reminded that most certainly nobody cries, um, is not the same woman who who is maybe the recipient, the listener mm -hmm. of the story about Love Fish um, and some other ones uh, in, in earlier parts of the book. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. Um, an excellent question again, and a very tough one because um, I'm, I'm honestly having trouble locating myself in my poems. Um, and um, so, Kost Moskale, it's a great Ukrainian poet who um, wrote a foreword to this other book that we spoke about today, the book in Ukrainian. Um, he, he says at some point that it's almost like there is no, you know, lyrical heroine in, in there. Um, and I agree um, to an extent. Um, you know, when, when I was writing my master's thesis, so that was quite a few years ago, um, I wrote about two poets that I really like. So one of those poets was Ted Hughes already mentioned today. Um, another one of those poets was Arseny Tarkovsky. So the father of um, Andrei Tarkovsky, the film director, and also absolutely brilliant um, poet in his own right. Um, if you haven't read him, I would highly recommend. And um, if you've seen Andrei Tarkovsky's The Mirror, um, the poetry um, in that film is, is his father's poetry. Um, so Arseny Tarkovsky. And what I wrote about, I actually wrote 
about, um, so both write a lot about poetry, but in very, very different ways. But they both are trying to locate themselves, a propos sort of this external world, the world of, you know, nature, um, but they do it in very different ways. So as I argued, and maybe today I would argue differently, but just to make my point, um, Tarkovsky sees himself as a translator of nature. So he's like, okay, I see this world, you know, and, and I'm trying to learn how to translate that language of grass, language of leaves, uh, language of stars um, into the human language, right? That somehow that other humans can read it, right? And uh, what Hughes does, for example, is very, very different. Um, I mean, Hughes was very, very interested in shamanism. You know, he, he sort of st studied at some point cultural anthropology. Uh, was it before or after switching to English? I don't remember. But he, he does a bit of the shamanic thing where he tries on um, something like a natural voice. And that's a very dangerous thing, right? Because what is a natural voice after all? right? We, we can't speak it. Uh, but um, who knows, because we are natural creatures as well, so can we? So Hughes has this lovely poem which is called Woodwall, um, and um, at least sort of proverbially it's like the, the second time the word was used in English language and it means something like a creature of the wild or creature of the forest, but, but it's actually the, the, the whole voice of the poem is a first-person narrative of this creature, which we don't know what it is, and it doesn't know what it is. And, and it's kind of trying to figure out by speaking, by inquiring about itself and, and how it fits into the world, right? The kind of dance in the air thing again. And I sort of sometimes feel like that Woodwo creature, like I'm just endlessly asking like, uh, how am I saying what I'm saying and, and who is saying what I'm saying? And so um, I suppose that my writing is, is actually an attempt to figure that out. So yeah, I would absolutely have huge trouble figuring out where I stand in my poems. I'm definitely there. And um, you mentioned different voices, you know, um, I, I don't know, we could go all Jungian uh, where is it Jungian in English? I'm never sure. But, um, and sort of, you know, think of anima and animus and all those components of human soul. But, but I just think that we are a lot of voices, all of us, and, and kind of a lot of people, not just in the sense that we all have multiple personalities, but in a sense, we reflect so many people and we are reflected by so many people. And we are like this little, and I'm fascinated by trees and I learned that trees, they all communicate. So the roots and the ground are all interconnect and apparently they share the resources, they share information, so to say, you know. Um, and, and so we, we are kind of like that. I like thinking of people like that. And, and so I like thinking of ourselves as this, you know, multiplicity of voices and, and personhoods. So I guess I sort of, touch upon that when I write, but this is me trying to rationalize something I don't know an answer to. So that it's just, just to flag that up, <laughs> but thank you. No, it's, it's that's perfect. Question. I think much like your poems, you know, the poet is all things at all times, right? Who's to say, who's to say that you must be a certain thing all the time, right? You, you have that, because if you exist in this rhizome, right, of, of organic relationships, you could be any, I mean, the trees know what the other trees know, like you could know what the other ones know. Uh, but I see, that's just... tricky as well, because it kind of makes you an Odysseus, right? It's like nobody, like what's your name? Nobody, if I'm everybody, I'm kind of nobody, right? So, uh, but yeah, thankfully the Odysseus poems are not in this book, so we don't have to talk about them, but they are like, out there. I'll, I'll catch up them. with you next time. Yeah, that, that's definitely <laughs> going to the notes. <laughs> definitely going into the notes. All right, our dear listeners and uh, visitors, who is brave enough to ask some questions, or I don't know if not brave, uh, Olesa, please. 
Hey, I'm going to uh, abuse my position of being able to uh, to ask a question quickly. Um, you know, of course, you're you're a poet and you're a translator, but you're also a scholar. Um, we haven't talked about that yet. You defended. I was your... trying to avoid that conversation. <laughs> you defended your PhD thesis. You are Dr. Uh, Irina Shavalova, and you defended it at Cambridge, and it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of scholarly work. My question is not so much about the 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 thesis itself. It's more about about writing. Um, I write scholarly work and I write creative work. I'm not a poet and never will be, but there's, there's something you have to do to yourself to switch from one style to another, from one way of thinking and expressing yourself to another. Um, and it's almost like you can't do both on the same day, at least in my case anyway. And this is what I want to ask you. How, how do you, can you sit and write a um, conference paper during the day and then do take some notes for for poetry writing later on in the day how does it work you know it seems all, all the answers to the questions i give today start sort of with hard or i'm having trouble with that. um uh and and i i hate to sort of you know answer in the same way but you know how they train little dogs sometimes i mean in in the horrible like cruel past where circuses were a thing you know with animals and they train dogs to like walk on their hand paws and and roll little cards and um on the one hand when 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 doing academic writing i do feel that way i it's it's you know a shame a shameful admission but i do feel that way like i'm a little dog and i trained myself you know to roll a card and and it's it's a long long way i have to roll that card for um that's on the one hand but you know i'm it, it, it's not the full answer because um i mentioned this story about you know my family and, and something that drives my creative work to an extent but um in a sense my research grew out in a very strange way which is now almost untraceable uh, maybe for other people from that same thing because like i said um I, I come from the family of people, a lot of whom in the previous generations were only able to express themselves through what we call oral culture, oral tradition, right? They, they couldn't be that written mark, um, often not through a fault of their own, right? They didn't have those opportunities. And um, my uh, inquiry, which in the end, so in the end, I, I looked um, into identity processes and sort of what kind of identities we can see in the songs of the war in Donbas, so very contemporary material, the war that's ongoing, has been going on since 2014, right? Um, but in a sense, this popular culture, this popular space, it's still a space that's, um, that resonates with a lot of voices. And it's still a space of sort of contemporary oral culture. I'm not going to go deep into it, but initially my idea was to look at folk songs. And I ended up looking at popular songs, but sort of touching upon the same issue. And for me, it's, it's a very, very meaningful thing to do, sort of look at um, what people say who might not be able to write it down in like in a fancy way and you know sort of as, as, a, as a person with an imposter syndrome I also often doubt myself as to like being able to write things down in a fancy way or just you know is, is what I'm saying are, are people getting it as a poet you know both and, and as a scholar both um, so am I being able to articulate myself and so yeah, it's it's this whole mission of articulation. I just think it comes to me more naturally when I'm writing as a poet, and and then you know the whole trained dog said saying when when I'm writing as a scholar. I enjoy it as well, but I enjoy it once it's done. You know, I look at it and I think, oh goodness, I you know, nice card I got there. <laughs> Thank you. The spirit, the spirit moves with an articulate inarticulate groanings right maybe perhaps that's oh it. yeah oh oh yeah it groans all the time you <laughs> know i think just um to wrap things up gradually today i'll read something that's called a small new year's elegy and it's a cycle which has two slightly longer poems and then um three very short ones um, and i will read it in english one the hospital windows are lit with an unwavering blue light. The frigid air, thick as dead water, rests in the crevasses of the night. 
a great final peace settles over the city and puddles of light under the street lamps flicker, flicker. A brand new era begins in which we barely got our feet wet and halted. The whole city froze, hesitating like Rembrandt's Susanna, caught off guard by an otherworldly light. With a desperate hand, she presses to herself her crumpled clothes and walks into the ink of the river. So a deeper, different kind of night begins. The walls straighten their hunched, tired backs beneath the rosy velvet sky. The snow swells with the raspberry juice of sorrow, walking beneath the trees as defenseless as large, blind birds. We turn over with our footsteps, the remaining living skin of the day and whatever is beneath it, quickly ices over. Two. The year doesn't care about us. Today, it's large, meaty heart doesn't beat any faster than usual. We made it all up. The idea that it has a beginning and an ending, like a bolt of clothing. Meanwhile, the roots and crown of the year are one. It goes on like a sad song sung by someone who sits alone on the shore of dark water, sees how silently the heavenly bodies enter the water, and emerge, holding the edges of the rustling skirts, not ashamed of their white knees. It's me, God, someone thinks standing near the window, watching the night unfold, watching the triumphant parade of snow, the dissolution of the city, shadows from the streetlights cling like children to their golden sleeves, the hospital windows become mercifully dark. The weight of the night fire falls against our eyelids. It's me, God, someone thinks. But who is me? Three. Here is one side of the night, patched, sewn from pieces of grandma's shirt, where there should have been a moon-shaped button there is a mark the size of the coin, the imprint of the moon's moist cheek. On the other side, because there is another side, a dog's thick fur that smells of stones, smeared soot, rust, a scratch mark dotted with dried blood, a window with the curtains drawn. Four. No one comes out of the night's big house. No one comes out, even though we call so loud that the paint falls from the ceiling so that ice cracks and our veins burst. But no one comes out of the night's big house. Its windows are lit with an unwavering light. Against it, our faces are small and lost, like the faces of children that emerged from the forest into the endless, empty field. And five. And when you don't sleep, when you stand at the window, tell me, please tell, what was it? that the big snow dragged into the city on its tail? What will fill our barns and pantries? What will fall into our open arms? What will sadly and carefully touch our parted lips? Thank you. This was outer space, I promise you a bit of it. That's that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, Irina Shavalova, please buy the book. Um, 
I don't think she's going to be very rich, even if we all do, but it will make <laughs> Thank you very happy. much, Nina, for the lovely prognosis. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Thank you so much. The links are in the chat. Um, very quickly, I like asking this question, Irina. Um, is there a question that you would absolutely love to be asked and you were never asked? No. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I just never think about it. Honestly, this is the first time I think about it. Uh, no, no, I mean, there are quite a few questions I don't like to be asked. I answer them anyway. No, no one asked them today, I, I must say. So, you know, like what time of the day is the best time for writing or like what, what season is your favorite or or um, I'm not entirely comfortable when people wish me more light in my life. And it's like, you know, I'm thinking, gosh, do, do people say like the same things to Nick Cave, for example, or, or do they not just because he's like scarier looking and, and like, you know, sort of, um, I, I don't know, but um, no, I, I don't have a question um, that I would, you know, like to answer, um, except perhaps, and now I'm going to contradict myself. Um, I actually really like when people ask about the, um, the epigraphs. To the books or poems because this is you know I, I like sharing so Roman asked earlier you know what I read and you know mm -hmm. what I watch and, and I love sharing those things and, and I think they kind of help you enter the same you know I never liked like how people use the word echo chamber because we think of it as something you know negative and it's like oh it's the same thing bouncing about and we don't hear other people properly just echoes or etc etc but in reality echo chamber it's, it's such a beautiful image if you think about it. And I actually love the idea of those echoes just, just maybe spreading from further away and to further away and, and kind of you know, connecting us somehow. And so, yes, I, I like being asked about the epigraphs. And um, so what about those epigraphs? Tell us about those. Well, see, it's I kind of did because, and I'm just checking which ones are in this book, but yes. So Nick Cave, I mentioned Nick Cave, and that's why I thought about epigraphs. There is an epigraph from Nick Cave, and it's animals pull the night around their shoulders, which, you know, um, I think you should be proud of that line. That's all yes. I'm going to say. It's like something out of, having spoken to you, it's like something out of an anime somewhere, right? The animals that pull the night around their shoulders. It's such a... Ooh. Kind wolf of rain, wolf rain. It was something I traumatized my daughter with when when she was eight, and and she said it was like the saddest thing she ever watched, and she's never gonna watch again. Something I recommend. But yes, it was an anime. It was very beautiful. It involved kind of very poetic animals, wolves, you know. But um, but I apparently traumatized my child with it. She's all right now, you know. But she was sad. She said that all the nice wolves died, which kind of happened. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank you so much. And thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for participating. Back over to Alessa for our closing. Absolutely, thank you both so much. What a joy it was to listen to you, Irina, reading your poetry tonight. Um, what, what a joy it was to listen to you, the two of you talking to each other. You clearly share so many experiences and ideas and it was just wonderful to hear you in conversation with each other so thank you Nina for such absolutely wonderful moderation as well thank you everyone for coming today and asking questions I really hope that all of us will have a bit more light in our life but whether it's light or darkness that you're experiencing pick up Irina's uh, poetry collection and read it I'm sure you'll find poems there for any possible disposition that you find yourself in and I'd and like may I just thank Olesa thank you so much for putting this event together and and thank you Maria for supporting us today and Nina wonderful moderation and just thank you everyone for joining us and I think it was a lovely conversation. And please come to all the events. I heard so many wonderful names. You know, Vitaly Chernetsky is fantastic. Attend his lecture. You know, Oksana Lusishina is fantastic. Just, just attend all of the events. Look at them. They're so well 
all that to put together. Thanks again, everyone. Oh, Irina, thank you so much for advertising us. Um, this rec the recording of the reading will be on our YouTube channel. So if you know of anybody who wasn't able to join us today, please share the link. We'll, we'll put it up in the next few days. So once again, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Ira. Thanks, everybody. And have a wonderful day, wonderful night.